Hi, my name is Jack Moreno, and I come from a past of abuse, drug and alcohol addiction, the new age, the occult, and eventually practicing ritual magic in a Freemason lodge as part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And I've started this series to expose the lies or share the lies that I believed when I was in the occult and compare them with the truth of God's word. The first video of that series was about my belief that I had that all is one or one is all. Basically that God is all and all is God. And if you'd like to watch that video, it goes into pantheism and panentheism. I'll put a link somewhere on this video for you to click. But this video is about another lie that I believed, which is that I believed that I could practice magic and sorcery and still be good with God. I believed that God was okay with magic, that I could still be in a saving relationship with Christ or with God and be into magical arts and practicing magic. And so I'd love to get into this today and expose why this is a lie. So let's ask the question, is God okay with magic? The order that I was in practiced magical arts like magic, Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, and I'd love to give a general definition for what magic is. When I was in the order, I would have defined magic as manipulating thought and energy to create my desired will or to manifest my desired will. Here are a few definitions of magic. Within the context of magical control, magic can be referred to as the art of causing changes with the aid of spiritual entities using spoken and written word, sigils, talismans, sacrifices, divination, and more. Another way of putting it is that magic is a practice where you use thought and energy manipulation, altered states of consciousness, rituals, communications with entities, and more to get your desired result. But just to try to give a simple definition of magic for now, we can say that magic is an art to bring about change through the force of one's will. And that brings me to say, I would love to in the future make a video about magic in today's culture and how prevalent it is. Magic in antiquity was practiced by both pagan and Jewish people. It had the goals of healing diseases, bringing about curses and blessings, and magicians also claimed to be able to tell the future. According to ancient literature like Pliny's Natural History and other discovered magical books, we see that magic often involved things like incantations, invocations, um, basically invoking entities by repeatedly calling on their names, as well as using sigils, amulets, and many other things that are extremely familiar to me from the magic that I practiced in this order. I'm just still so amazed that God would save me. I was involved in hermetic magic towards the end of my journey in the occult, and that has to do with the Egyptian deity Thoth or Toth and uh, Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus. And it basically, he's, Thoth is known as the patron of magic and Hermes is known as um, basically a connection between humanity and the gods. These are general, very surface level definitions, but I hope that they can be helpful in kind of getting a context for what we're talking about when we're discussing magic and sorcery. The secret arts that I was practicing in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and in the occult in general, mainly traced back to ancient Egyptian secret mystery schools. And so I'd love to talk about that now. So let's answer question number one. Is magic real? Does magic work? To answer this, let's look at Exodus in the Bible. In Exodus 7, the Lord uses Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and ask that Pharaoh let the people of Israel go who had been in slavery in Egypt for around 400 years. Exodus 7, 8 to 13 reads, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. In this, we see that the magicians did the same by their secret arts. They were able to replicate this miracle. Again, in Exodus 7, 
after that, Pharaoh's heart is hardened as we saw. And so God has Moses and Aaron go to the Nile to meet Pharaoh there to show that God is the only true God. He had Aaron take his staff and stretch out his hand over the Nile so that the Nile would be turned to blood. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And all of the water in the Nile turned into blood, just as God had said. The fish in the Nile died and the water stank so that the Egyptians could not drink the water. And there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. And then we read in verse 22, But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So again, we see here that the Egyptians are somehow able to replicate this miracle, and they also are able to do this by their secret arts. It's interesting, though, when we look at it, that although the magicians were able to copy or repeat or imitate this sign, they were not able to reverse it. And we can see this in Exodus 7, verses 24 to 25, where it reads, And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. This continues again in Exodus 7. Pharaoh continues to refuse to let the people go. And so God sends Moses and Aaron to send a plague on the land of Egypt of frogs. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land. And then we read in Exodus 8, 7. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Again, reading through this, so struck by how the Egyptians are able to copy it by their secret arts, but again, they do not reverse it. And we know that that's true because we see in the very next verse that Pharaoh begs Moses and Aaron to make this plague go away, saying that if they do, he'll let the people of Israel go. And so God reversed it. We see in verse 13, the frogs died in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So why did God reverse the plague? Well, thankfully, God's word tells us in verse 10. In verse 10, Moses says to Pharaoh, Tomorrow, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. So let's move on to question two. How then are the magicians doing this? What power are they getting this from? We've covered that magic is real. The Bible has made clear that the magicians were able to copy these things by their secret arts. But it's important to really remember and get a hold on what power is behind these secret arts that they're using. If the magicians are doing this in opposition to God, then is this power coming from the true God of the universe or somewhere else? 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Ephesians 6, 12 also tells us what we're dealing with. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So number three, is God really in control then? Let's go back to Exodus 7 where this all began. In verse 5, it says, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt, and bring out the people of Israel from among them. God is in control of everything. He allows all of this to happen, and he does these things to show that he is the one and only true God. And we can see that as we continue through the book. In Exodus 8, 17 to 19, we see something very interesting happen. When God creates something out of nothing, the Egyptians are not able to replicate it at all. Not only that, but they accept their defeat. Let's read it. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. The Egyptians could not replicate or reverse this. This continues, and in Exodus 9-11, we see that the magicians could not even stand before Moses because of the boils that came on them from a plague. Not only could they not reverse this, they 
were overcome by it and they couldn't even stand before Moses. It reads, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And the interesting thing is in verse 19, the Egyptians knew why they couldn't reverse it. It says, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. This is very interesting. When we look at the power of God compared to the power and the secret arts that these magicians are using, even looking back to the first sign when Aaron's staff turns into a serpent and that serpent swallows the serpent that the Egyptians are able to replicate. God's power is infinitely greater than whatever this power these magicians are using is. God is God and there is no other. Second Timothy 3 actually speaks on these magicians being opposed to God. It says, just as Jonas and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men speaking of the magicians that came up against Moses and Aaron. So Satan is the God of this world, but only temporarily, whereas Christ rules victorious for eternity. Second Corinthians four, three to four says this, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But the Bible is clear about Satan's fate. Let's read Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So number four, what does God think about magic? What does God say about magic? God's word places sorcery among the works of the flesh, which are opposed to the spirit, which means they're opposed to God. Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. God does not take pleasure in these things. They are opposed to him. The works of the flesh are actions that flow out of sinful human nature, out of the fallen man. Apart from Christ, these are the harmful actions towards which humans naturally go. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, now the works of the flesh are evident. And it goes on to name sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So sorcery, the word used here is pharmakia. It refers to sorcery, magical arts. It's often found in connection with idolatry and fostered by idolatry. Pharmakia is a Greek word that originally referred to medicine, but eventually only to mind altering and mood altering drugs, as well as the occult and witchcraft in general. Interestingly, many pagan rituals often involved mind altering substances. Let's read Deuteronomy 18, which makes very clear God's stance on sorcery, on magic. It says, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. That is very clear, dear friend, about how God views sorcery and magic and things like these. He views these people as an abomination to the Lord. And that included me. Idolatry and sorcery reject the way that God has commanded for us to worship him. It's our will over his will. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. God has made the way for us to connect with him. Those who practice sorcery are serving a different God, a false God, an idol. They are not serving God. So number five, what happens to those who practice magic? Revelation 22 tells us, 
verses 14 to 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Thank you, Christ, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. But outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Those who love satanic falsehood will be outside of the kingdom. Revelation 21 verses 6 to 8. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is God speaking. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And the word here for sorcerer is used of Egyptian and Babylonian magicians. And an example of that is Exodus 7 where we began. The end of sorcerers sounds a lot like the end of Satan. Magic is rebellion against God. God is clear in his word that he is opposed to magic and that magic is opposed to him. So quickly, let's review the main points. Magic is an art where you use energy control, rituals, or communication with entities to get your desired result. Magic is an art to bring about change through the force of one's will. Second, an example we see of magic in the Bible is Moses and Aaron versus the Egyptian magicians in Exodus. Number three, God opposes magic. It's opposed to him. It's a work of the flesh. And according to Deuteronomy 18, those who practice such things are an abomination to the Lord. And number four, the fate of those who practice magic is clear. Revelation 21, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So in light of all of that, how do we respond? Me, someone who practiced magic, someone who loved magic, lusted after magic. How do I respond? If I really believe that magic was good, that God was good with it, and all of these things, when presented with this, how do I respond? The proper response is to turn from magic into Christ. Christ is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through him god has made a way for us to have a relationship with him through his son and so we are to turn away from that which is an opposition to god we are turn, to turn away from the things that god hates like magic and turn to the true and living god and we see a great example of that in acts 19 verses 18 to 19 says many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices and a number of those who'd practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. So the answer to all of this is to turn to Jesus. But who is Jesus? Is Jesus a great magical practitioner? Is he an ascended master? Is he just a powerful being like an angel or like Satan? Or is he just a man in right relationship with God? Who is this Jesus and why should we turn to him? None of those are correct. Ephesians 1 talks about Christ seated at the right hand of God, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Meaning he is far above any spiritual entities, far above Satan, and far greater than anything that is behind or that you can get from magic or any of its practices. Christ is greater Christ is greater than anything, anything that this world has to offer you. Christ is greater. Christ is God. And so let's close by reading Colossians 1 together to really get a picture of who Christ is. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death 
in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. So to close, God is perfectly holy. He is far above everything and he created all things and every good thing and every perfect gift is from him. He made us and yet we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have rebelled against this holy, perfect, good God and gone our own way. And none of our good works will ever be enough to take that away because the wages of sin is death and we deserve death as a payment for our sin. We have rebelled against the God of all. And so how does someone like me, like us, who have sinned against this God and gone our own way, how do we become reconciled to God? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Christ came and he was born to a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life that none of us have ever lived or could ever live. And he died on the cross in our place, bearing our sins for us and bearing God's wrath that we deserved for us, taking our place on that cross for us. He died he was raised on the third day, and now he's seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for those who believe in him. So what must we do to be saved? Well, repent, turn from your sins, and believe in Christ alone for your salvation. Don't trust in your good works. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in whatever works you're doing to have a relationship with God. The only way to the Father is through Christ. And so we put our faith in him alone, his finished work on the cross, him bearing our sins in our place on the cross for our salvation. And the Bible says that Christ is the one and only mediator between God and man. And a mediator is an official go-between who acts as a link between two parties to reconcile their differences. The term literally means one who stands in between. And Christ alone can stand in the gap between God and man. And so the only way to the Father is through Christ. And so if you believe this, if you are a true believer, if you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ alone for your salvation, then you need to see magic for what it is. It's an abomination to the Lord. And if you're practicing magic and you don't know Christ, I beg you, I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That is amazing. Um, and there is salvation in Christ. And just, if you're serving the enemy, keep in mind that he loses, the Bible is clear, and Christ is the victor. Christ is victorious, he is glorious, he is God. Um, so serve the God of creation, serve the God who is Lord, has always been and will always be, as opposed to the God of this world that is perishing. Um, so I hope that this was somewhat helpful. I. Pray, Lord willing, to continue to make videos exposing more specific lies that I believed in the occult and comparing them with the truth of scripture. If you have any questions, if you're in the occult, if you're coming out of it, if you're dabbling in manifesting or magic or things like this and you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I will put my contact in the description as well as resources in the description. And please, if you have questions, if there are other places in the Bible that you um, see magic or if there's magic practices that you see in the world around you today, comment and share them. Um, I'd love to see what you're experiencing and what kind of things you're hearing out in the world today that remind you of this. So thank you so much for this time together and I'll see you next time.